Okay, in this video we're going to be taking a look at how to get all the pieces exported from the various different programs, so that could be ZBrush and then Maya, importing them into Substance Painter, and then making sure that we have a good first bake, and after we get the first bake on here, this is what we should see, something like this. We should be able to see just a flat color on our model. We should be able to see all the information that's been baked down from our high resolution mesh down to our low resolution mesh and it should start to look almost identical to the high resolution piece. There's going to be a little bit of difference here and there because of the amount of polygons we might have in different areas, but it should be a fairly accurate representation from the high res down to the low res. So let's go ahead and hop into Maya and get started and take a look at the different pieces that we're going to need to import into Substance Painter. Okay, here we are inside of Maya, and there's a few things that I really want to draw to your attention about making sure that we're setting ourselves up for the best case possible for baking really high quality maps inside of Substance Painter and doing it in a way that uh, we can get separate pieces to only bake for uh, specific pieces if we want and uh, just giving us a lot of flexibility. So I know in earlier videos we talked about how to export parts out from uh, ZBrush and uh, doing high resolution exports where we've got um, uh, poly paint information on there to do uh, material ID. So I think material ID is really important. The other thing that's really important is that we have game resolution pieces that are named correctly and they're named the same as our high resolution pieces. So um, what I have here is I've got a folder inside of Maya and I've put everything and I've, I'm just calling it game res. And then here you can see that for every high res part, I've got a low res part. And I might have had to take some of my models and then combine them together. So like if you take multiple multiple models and you're under modeling, you can go to mesh and you can combine. So I had to make sure I combined all the right pieces and after that was done, I uh, named my pieces and I made sure to do case sensitive and underscores and at the end of it it would be underscore low and then you can see that there's a, um, a correlating piece that says underscore high. Um, I also have this for the wheels low and I have wheels high. Um, I could show you on here I have this on the layer for the, uh, for the high res part and I can hide the, the game res part. So everything that you're seeing there on the low res part has also got a correlating high res part. So I'll just put this back on the game res. Um, so you can see I've got these wooden body low, side block low, handle, and uh, the axles for these things. And again, so I have a high res piece that is matching exactly the same exact name and everything. So what I found is I have a slight case of dyslexia maybe a little bit ADD too. Uh, so typing is not my friend whenever I go to type stuff. Uh, if you get any of this uh, incorrect, it won't work. So what I found is if I double click on this, um, I can just you know copy this part and I can go to a high res part and I can go here and I could select this and just paste it in there. Um, and at that point, you know maybe I have to just type high and low and keep track of that and so that's really helped me out so if you have those similar kind of issues that I do then these can be just little simple steps that could uh, potentially help you and make sure that you're uh, getting everything with the right name because it's super super important okay I'm gonna jump over to ZBrush and just draw this to your attention again just to make sure that we're um, keeping this clear at this stage that what I've got on here is poly paint information. So you can see I've, I've got this here for each one of the parts. And then I've color coded it with a very bright uh, color. Now the colors don't necessarily matter all that much. You can use a wide range of colors, but you can see um, this is enough of a difference in this purple and this purple that um, it'll be easy for the program inside of Substance Painter to be able to get a color picker and just say, I want to pick this and now it's going to fill all that with a mask and it'll fill this with a mask. If they're really, really close together, you might have some issues. So just try to pick colors that are uh, definitely far enough apart from each other so you don't run any kind of issues like that. So again, the naming convention, um, where those high-res pieces that you saw inside of Maya came from, and we've looked at this in an earlier video, just making sure we uh, are emphasizing this, is that the naming convention that I have here is in the subtool, 
that's the thing that actually matters because I could I could export all these pieces out and I could export them all out as an FBX so if I went to the Z plugin and grab this and dock it over if I go to the FBX exporter you can say I could I could export just whatever selected right here so I have this this um, FBX selected for this and if I did that it would export this thing out and then I can give the FBX that I uh, export out I can give it any name that I want um, whenever you go to read that back into substance you might think oh I named the file this particular name with underscore high and why isn't it working well the problem is it's gonna grab the naming convention from your actual subtool that you have right and so um, you could export out as selected you can use visible and whatever is visible you can see I've got hidden parts in here and stuff like that it's only gonna export out the visible parts and it's going to retain the names that you got for the uh, subtools over here and if you put it on all no matter if it's visible or uh, hidden it's going to export everything right and so that's how you're exporting from ZBrush and if you've got the poly paint information turned on it's going to export that out along with it right so that's how you're going to get your high-res pieces out let's go back over to Maya and then what I want to do for my my game res part just double check your names. I know I keep emphasizing the name thing, but it, it's, it's super, super important. Now to export this thing out as a final piece, we can uh, make a, a group inside of Maya, right? And so we can uh, select multiple things and hit Control G, and that's how you can make a group. You can do it that way. Uh, you can go to Create uh, Empty Group, and then you could middle mouse drag things into the group. So that's a possibility for you. So it doesn't matter what the, the group name is called. Um, but what matters is these names that you have in here, okay? The other thing that's going to matter is what material you have on this. So inside of Substance Painter, if you want to uh, paint on this whole thing and you want everything to be on one map, and that's what I'm doing for this one, you can see every all the pieces... Uh, or individual but they're all laid out on this zero to one space if I want to paint all my pieces on the zero to one space I'm gonna have everything put into the zero to one space in the UV area just like what we talked about before and then I'm gonna also make sure if I hit control a I'm gonna bring up the attribute editor and I'm going to make sure that I have um, one material that's being used on all these different pieces so you can see I made a material called M underscore canon for material underscore canon and each of these pieces have been assigned this M canon right so after you create a uh, material you can always just uh, right click in here and say um, assign a new material you could do that and that will assign a brand new one and you can name it and if there's a material already made you can say right click and say assign existing material and so I can just select all the pieces and then assign whatever I called it and in this case again M underscore canon and that ensures that all these different pieces will be in substance painter and I'll be able to paint on those at uh, all at the same time all right now if you do want to bust this up and let's say you wanted to uh, paint inside a substance painter and you said I want to paint and I want to make sure I'm painting with just the wood and everything on the wood would be one thing I would go ahead and assign a new material for this and I might uh, call it M underscore wood and then after that I would select all these pieces and I would assign it an uh, M underscore metal or something like that and at that point I got two materials on all these different pieces uh, when I export it out into substance painter it will view those and it calls it texture sets that will only allow you to paint on that one particular texture set but what it'll allow you to do is this if you wanted to if you wanted to have higher resolution on all your metal pieces you could have a material for just your metal pieces and you lay that out in the zero to one space and then you would have something for the wood and then that would all be laid out in the zero to one space so as you can see right now as I'm selecting these pieces you see all this dead space that's in here if I wanted to uh, relay this out and make it all fit in this zero to one space and give it a different material, then I get this whole entire uh, area for the texture for just the wood. And then likewise for the metal, 
let's deselect that. Um, I would have to relay this out to be in the zero to one space and then assign it a material. And then at that point, I get a whole another texture set inside a substance for just the metal. Um, now it gives you a little bit more to deal with when you export it out to UE4 and you would have to deal with those uh, texture sets. Those texture sets end up becoming two different materials inside of uh, UE4. And so it's just more for you to manage. Um, so just know that it's there for you and it's available. We're not going to be doing that on this one. We're going to be keeping everything together all as one object and we're going to be using uh, the material ID and we're going to be using the naming convention to, to control things as much as we possibly can. But I do want you to be aware that um, this is how Substance handles those things. If you import into Substance and you notice you've got multiple texture sets with different things that are called different materials, it's because you did not assign the same material to the entire uh, uh, set of objects that you have inside of Maya. Okay? So to export this out, we're going to be able to just take this whole entire group information and you're going to say File, Export Selection, and I'm going to put it on uh, the FVX export type. And if we go to the Edit Preferences, you can see I'm going to uh, kick out Smoothing Groups, Tangents, and Binormals, Smooth Mesh. And this is what I use uh, to actually import into UE4 as well. So I'll just go ahead and keep all that just the way that it is. And then I'll close that and say Export Selection. And then it would be uh, a matter for navigating to where you sit and then going to the FBX. And then um, I think what I called this was just Canon underscore all FBX. And so you can just export that out. And once you have that done, you've done everything that you need to do inside of Maya to export this out. Now, before I end this little part of this section of the video, I just want to call out that once this is established, I'll, I'll show you inside of Substance how we could potentially, like if you wanted to update the UVs and change the UVs, um, I'm going to show you how you could uh, just re-import that back in. It's not really even a, uh, a big deal at all, um, but if you establish a pipeline for yourself and you establish the way that you're exporting your parts and your naming conventions and everything else like that, it's going to be real easy for you to go back and say, you know what, I, gotta, I think I'm going to relay out the UVs just a little bit in this particular area. You could import it back into Substance, rebake your maps, and all the texture work that you've done is still going to hold there, and everything is uh, going to just be able to update pretty darn easy. So with a little bit of pre-planning and thinking at the very beginning stages, it can save you a whole lot of time and effort later on down the road. Okay, here we are inside of Substance Painter, and I'm going to go ahead and just start a brand new project. And so we're going to take a look at how we got to this point and built up to here. It's going to say File New, and we're going to start a new project. Now I'm going to push this into the Unreal Engine, so I'm just going to use this template, uh, the Unreal Engine for Allegro Rhythmic. Document resolution, I want to put this at 4096, uh, so that's the highest uh, resolution that we can currently paint at. I'm just going to select my file, and you want to navigate to wherever you put this. I'm using FBX files, and then um, I called mine Canon underscore gameres.fbx, and I'm going to go ahead and open that up and hit OK. Now, if you bake maps from the other areas, you saw there was a button on there for uh, importing baked maps, so you can import that all in at the same time. So, navigation is just like Maya, Alt, left click, Alt, middle, mouse, drag, and Alt, right click will let you zoom in. So, that's pretty simple as far as the uh, navigation goes. Um, I think, let me just go and uh, see about going to the UI. And I'm just going to reset the UI and just see, make sure I've got everything kind of the default, like what uh, you would be seeing here, like this. So um, in this version, we've got the ability to come in here and we can uh, scroll scroll up here. And this is where we could see uh, the like environment opacity. I do have blur set on there. So yours might look something like this. This is what I kind of like to, to look at on here. If I do have the environment on here, I like to uh, definitely blur that out just so I don't visually really pay attention to that and see that just because to me that becomes kind of visual noise that I have to deal with and take a look at. Uh, if you want you can you can drop down the environment opacity. Um, I do like to have shadows turned on for this. 
the computation, if you put it on lightweight, it generates the shadow information pretty quickly. Uh, if the shadows are too strong, you can take the shadow opacity, so you can just have a little bit on there. I do like to have the shadow information just because it helps me understand something about the dimensionality of what I'm taking a look at. Um, so obviously, with uh, if you've got this in this intensive, it's going to uh, take a little bit longer to generate that, but the quality is going to be better and stuff like that. So you'll just have to kind of figure out what, what, what you need. So if you're evaluating at the end, you might want to put it on to intensive and then crank that up a little bit more. Uh, but as you're painting, you want uh, better performance, so you just might uh, put that on something like lightweight or, or something like that at the beginning. Um, I'm not really going to change anything with the the field of view, anything like that. Um, I do like to put on post effects, and I do kind of like to turn on this vignette. I'm going to turn back down the uh, um, environment opacity and put that all the way down to zero for that. Uh, so with a vignette, also want to turn on anti-aliasing, and uh, we could, you know, the higher the number is, the more it's going to take for uh, the amount of time for that. We're not really doing anything for uh, subsurface scattering, but if you want to turn that on, it's a possibility for t for you to turn on subsurface scattering. And then we've got uh, different settings for um, your textures. And again, so this is going to be depending on uh, you know the frame rate and everything else like that. So you just you got to kind of weigh the pros and cons of like the image quality and how great that looks versus the performance that you're going to have. Um, so I'll just kind of leave that alone. I do know they've got right here, if you scroll down in this area, you can turn on the, the mesh wireframe. And I think that's pretty good at the very beginning stage, just to make sure everything looks like it's on the uh, the up and up as far as the geometry coming through for this. Um, and then we've got these different tabs too. So you can see it kind of just lets you go to these, jump to these different sections kind of quickly on here. And then here's where we've got uh, shader settings. So if you wanted to do something that had alpha in there, you're able to choose like PBR metal rough with um, alpha test and alpha blending. Alpha test is just alpha that's either going to be on or off for transparency. It's a much more simplified version of alpha and that would equal out to the same thing in like UE4 um, opacity masked. And um, if you want fru full translucency, then you would be choosing this this metal uh, PBR metal rough with alpha blending that you see on here. And again, what we've got is um, the quality of the shaders and how intensive that's going to be. Uh, so it will look better if you go higher. It's just going to take more performance. Uh, there's a parallax occlusion mapping on there, and that's getting a bit more advanced. So you got real-time displacement and tessellation, which is really kind of interesting with this they're starting to open up the ability that you can kind of sculpt inside of the program, which it seems a little crazy, but um, it's actually uh, pretty cool. Now to get that information out, they've been um, allowing you to spit out the model and everything when you're done, or you could spit out a um, uh, displacement map from there. So that's pretty, uh, pretty darn uh, cool in there. And again, you can easily go between these different areas on here. I'm just gonna put this back on PBR Metal Rough like this. Uh, then let's see what else we have. We got uh, a log file and things like that. So the next part is talking about layers and this is where we're going to start working with so we can start painting things like that. But right now what we're concerned with is this texture settings. If you remember me talking about the section where we were just inside of Maya and how many texture sets you would have, this is where they would show up. So uh, if everything comes across correctly, you can see I've got this M underscore Canon, and that came from the naming convention of the material that we made and assigned inside of Maya. And if everything was correct, it should come over like this and there should be one shader. Now this would be the area where if you see some other material in here, this is where you've assigned multiple materials inside of Maya, and that's gonna come across, right? And if you wanted to paint on this other one, there would be one here and you'd be able to select that or select the top one. And that's what's gonna uh, have you go between the two different um, materials and stuff like that. So we also have this size and it's set to 4096. Now you can go higher if you bake your maps and stuff like that. And we'll, we'll look at that. But right now we're just gonna worry about 4096. 
And if you need additional channels that you want to uh, paint with, like say subsurface scattering, you would go here with this plus, and then you can add a uh, particular channel. Um, I definitely like emissive. So if I was going to paint with emissive, I could add that. Um, like I was saying, if you're doing subsurface scattering, you could put scattering on there and you can start to uh, work with that. And so right now, if you want to go and you want to bake, everything's set up, everything's good to go as far as baking the information. So now we come down to this area and say bake mesh maps. Let's go ahead and select this on here. Uh, we're going to put the output size. I'm going to put this at 4096. It is possible to go to higher, but we're just going to leave that uh, where it sits. This dilation width is uh, the UV borders on your model that we saw inside of Maya for the UV layout. This is how many pixels it can uh, push out uh, from there. And um, let's see other things that are kind of important. So if we use this max frontal distance and max rear distance. Uh, if you think about this, this max frontal distance, if you imagine the way that it captures the information that it's baking, it takes a look at this low res mesh and it sends a ray this direction out or in. And whenever that ray marches out and hits a surface going out or in, then it captures that information at that point and the normal information and color and everything else like that. So it's really kind of taking this, this becomes the cage that they say. Um, and each polygon is going to, like I said, going to from the normal direction. So you can see on these, these are, we've got this angle. So the normal faces perpendicular to this. And so this normal would face out this way. These normals face out this way and each one of these would face out these directions and so that's that's the direction that's sent out to uh, send a ray and march out to kind of find the high res surface and so you've got a frontal ray distance that's traveling out to find the surface and then you also have a max rear distance that comes this direction and starts to try to find that so if you start to see um, let's say parts are really really close together if you start to see that this wood is picking up information from like the wheel, then you might want to decrease these numbers. And I would do something like, see this is at 0 0.01, I would do like 0 0.005 at first. And try increments like that and do some tests and see where you're at uh, for that. Uh, the This is one way to help you get uh, better baking information, make sure you're not baking things that shouldn't be baking. I usually don't turn anti-aliasing on. If you do that, it might take a little bit longer. Um, you could you could turn that on. This is where we were talking about uh, matching, and this is super confusing to me. So if we wanted to make sure that this part of the cannon only baked and used the high-res part of the cannon, remember we were using underscore low and high. I capitalize my pieces and so I'm gonna change that like that and you would think that it's telling it to always match the name but it it's not this is just the default thing and that's not what's happening if you wanted to use this naming convention you have to push this to by mesh name and then it will uh, it will work at that point the other thing that I thought was super confusing about making sure we're baking with the only the right parts. If you go to bake ambient occlusion, which ambient occlusion is really cool, it takes a look at cracks and recesses and just like real light. Uh, real light would get trapped in the corners and things like that. So AO kind of uh, simulates that. But if you only want AO to bake for part by part, um, what you need to do is put this self occlusion that needs to be put on only uh, same mesh name as well. So once we've done that, we're good to go for those parts. Okay, I know this is a lot of information up front before we even see the results of baking, but I want to make sure you guys understand before we start baking uh, some of the issues that you could potentially run into and some of the things you want to uh, kind of look out for, right? Now, if you want to make your own cage file, you could use this cage file um, and it would be basically if you took this model and you manipulated it inside of Maya, you could you could do that and make a uh, cage file for that. 
that's getting a bit more advanced, so it's probably a little bit beyond the scope. But just know that it's there and it's an option so for something that you can use. So here's where we're going to add our high-res meshes. And you can just click this little file icon right here. And then we're going to go to um, the area where we've got high-res pieces. And I've got all my high-res pieces here. Um, again, so if we're exporting from ZBrush, remember those part names mattered for the subtool name. And I used the FBX option in there to just export selected. So I exported each one of these pieces separately like this. Um, it's possible to just select them all and hit open. So now whenever it bakes the textures for this, it's going to look at all those different high-res pieces and use them. And it's going to treat it as if this is one big giant model. But this is where we get the different names and the naming conventions and how that can match up to what we got going on uh, on the uh, the uh, game res FBX part. So I was going to click the M bake M underscore Canon uh, mesh maps like this. Uh, one last thing before I do that, I'm going to go to the ID map, and that's where it gets the color information from ZBrush. And we're going to put this on uh, vertex color, and we're going to leave it on hue shift. And that's just saying we've exported out um, polypaint information, and it's really being baked down to the, ver the vertex. So that's why it's grabbing vertex color at that point. So let's go ahead and click the button. And we'll start to see this and watch this uh, bake out the different maps. Um, now, I do know that I think they've been shifting all this to get faster and faster for uh, the different baking of the information. And you can see as it starts... Uh, baking this out it's pretty cool that you can actually see uh, visually some of the results as it starts to bake so we got it's telling you actually the different steps that it's going through so this is the the normal information then uh, did the world space uh, information now it's working on the Canon ID and that's cool that that's actually working. That's uh, the ID mask is generated from the vertex color that we got. This is going to make it way easier for us to be able to go with a color selector and just select these different parts as mask. This is where it's going to start to generate the ambient inclusion. And this is where I was telling you that it's going to look at uh, distances between parts and basically how light kind of gets trapped in corners and crevice and cracks and produce a darkening effect in those areas. Now that does um, take a little bit longer for this to calculate. I think the longest map that it takes to calculate is probably the thickness map. Um, after the AO is baked, the next one that's going to do is curvature. Curvature is pretty darn cool too. It uh, produces, I think, kind of like a gray looking map. And um, it produces white in areas that are high and then dark in the areas that are recessed and so you can utilize that map and um, I think substance kind of uses that a lot for edge wear and edge detection so a lot of their material generators that they have will allow you to put damage and things like that on edges and so thickness the or, sorry not the thickness the um, the curvature map really helps out uh, with with that information so I just paused the video and um, letting the AO map continue to bake and it's getting pretty close to being done so I just wanted to uh, unpause the video so we can see the uh, completion of that map and then uh, start to see the uh, creation of the curvature map and I do believe the curvature map should bake quite a bit quicker um, Again, like I was saying, I, I, I think ambient occlusion and definitely thickness seem to be the ones that uh, take the most amount of time to bake. So it should be getting close to that. And that one's finished up. Yep, and you can see curvature is going to go a lot faster here. And so this is what I was telling you. The uh, areas that are high up are uh, 
painted like a white kind of color. Uh, anything in between is kind of a gray. Uh, and things that are recessed might be in the in, in black. Uh, actually, it looks like uh, I'm, I'm I'm wrong on that. I'm sorry. So uh, maybe the darker spots is just the regular thing, and then it looks like all my cracks and everything are on there. But you can see at the very end it changed very quickly. So we'll have to take a look at them after everything's kind of done. So the position map is something that uh, you saw that very quickly, but it becomes a gradient. Um, so any color information, if you take away the color, it just becomes a black and white image. And so if they give a color on the top, bottom, left, right, front, and back, uh, those colors as a gradient mean direction. And so some of their shaders and generators and things like that allow you to make masks and things like that based off of uh, those that color information that is baked. And again, the thickness, it looks like the thickness map might actually be going a bit faster than uh, the AO map. Um, I've seen that one take a lot longer in, in other times. Um, so this one is kind of interesting with the subsurface scattering. I know we're not doing subsurface scatter on here, but if you're doing something like a human face, you might get areas like the nose or the uh, thinner parts of your ears it'll bake out the actual thickness of those parts and then you can actually use that map that thickness map to drive something that says something about uh, uh, the thickness and again subsurface scattering is in those thinner parts that's where you're going to see the most kind of uh, scatter of the light going through there and so here the thickness is about ready to finish up and as soon as it does that, we'll see the results of what everything has been made. And I might suggest right after everything finishes up that you go ahead and save. But we can go ahead and hit OK for that. I'm going to go ahead and click back on here and just go down and turn the wireframe off so we just don't have to look at the wireframe. Now, the first thing, this is going to conclude us being able to bake our maps and everything that we need for our maps. But I want to, real quick, just go to Layers, and I'm going to make a new fill layer. And this will allow us to go in the fill layer. And we can double-click on this and rename it. Let's just call this, like, Base Material, something like that. We don't need this uh, empty layer that we got. We can trash that. And what we can do with this, I'm going to drag this up just a little bit. I'm only going to worry right now about color, roughness, and metal. And so we're going to get into this more, but just to check things out, you can see that our color information is at a value of 0.5, and I might drag this down a little bit to, it looks like maybe about 0.3, somewhere in that uh, vicinity. And then roughness, we can click and drag out. If we push it all the way to one, then it's fully rough and there's no uh, specular to it. There's no uh, reflectivity. If we put it on um, zero like this, then it's going to be highly uh, glossy and reflective. I don't really want that. So I'm going to push it somewhere in here just to check out the model quality. Make sure I've got a nice amount of spec on there. So I might put that, that looks like a 0.33, somewhere around there. Now, if you want this to have a metallic feel, zero is um, black, pure black is it's not going to be metallic. And if you push it all the way over here, it's going to be uh, full metallic. Now, at that point, you could take your roughness and you could drag it back like this. So I get a nice specular component on it. 0.6. And then metallic makes things a bit darker and more saturated too. So we could go back to the base color and push this back up and get somewhere somewhere in here let's let's go right about I'll do 0.6 for this and then for the roughness keep dragging that up just a little bit more now really with metallic uh, some people will not be happy about this if you did in between numbers it's either supposed to be metallic or not but just for checking out model quality and stuff like that shouldn't be a big deal but if you wanted to be somewhere in this range, um, 
I think um, this is pretty good for being able to check out exactly what's coming through for the bake. So again, this is all just coming from our um, our high res mesh and just checking and making sure all of our details came through and everything uh, seems to be working good. So yeah, so pretty happy with this. The other thing before we move on to the next section and talk about painting is we've got up here under material we can uh, take a look at single channels we can take a look at the base color and this is this this color right here the albedo color uh, we don't have any height information on here yet uh, roughness that's actually coming from this value right here that you see so I'll put this back on 0.7 if we go to metallic you can see the metallic value that we have we can push this up or drag it down Let's just put this at point, I'll put 2.85. And normal information. Um, I think you want to see, uh, let's see, normal plus height. That will show you the actual normal map that was baked out on here uh, for this. Because after we bake, I, I should have just kind of explained this to you. Um, you can go under, after we bake this, you can see the different maps that have been baked and put in here so you can always swap those out with something from a different program or, or whatever but this after they're baked this is where it's throwing things so it's going to bake the normal map the world space normal map the id map the ambient occlusion the curvature position and then the thickness on here so um, we could look at emissive which we don't have anything on there currently yet scattering we don't have anything on there yet uh, mesh maps here's the normal map information so these are the things that are actually baked out and this is pretty cool that we can just see this this is the the world space uh, normals uh, this is the ID map so here's all of our color information so we're gonna be able to take the color picker and pick from that thing here's the AO map that was baked out for us and we can take a look around there um, just even with that map alone that it produces uh, quite a bit of information that we could turn into and kind of help with uh, our painting process so my idea is that uh, the best sculpt that you have the better your painting is going to be because you're going to have to do even less painting depending on uh, what you get from uh, the the high-res mesh right and here's the curvature map and this is what i was telling you as it baked i was getting a little confused as to what i was looking at so i don't i don't know what it does post-process at the end of it but it makes a kind of a gray map and let's just say that's a mid value um, mid height right and then the darker areas equal out the recesses and then as it gets lighter it's towards the edges and the cracks and stuff like that so you could probably tell from just this looking at this map alone that there's a lot of information again that came from the high-res mesh and that's going to help us out quite a bit whenever we go to paint our textures, right? And paint our different materials and everything else like that. So the curvature together with the AO and then a little bit of color and the normal map and everything else like that starts to produce something that's uh, pretty convincing. This is what I was telling you about for the position map and how it's got uh, gradients. So you can see it's using like a, a green kind of color over here. There's a direction for down below, front, top, left and right and that's what what's giving us this different uh, these different colors and again if you took away the color information those end up being just black and white gray maps and they become like gradients that you could use uh, on some different maps that you might be generating a little bit later and so here's the thickness map that was generated and again it's all pretty cool to see all these different maps and if you put it back on here just put it on material this is going to put it back into this base material so we can just look at that okay this very last part we're going to talk about something that i think is uh, pretty exciting but it's a way that we can make camera data inside of maya export that out pull that into substance painter then we can take that and put uh, substance painter into iray and it's a mode of doing like an offline render and get really nice renderers for stuff so what I'm going to show you is, in Maya, I like to make a folder group called cameras and store all my cameras in there. So it's easy to make a new camera. You can go uh, panels, perspective, and then say new and make a new camera. You have that, 
Um, we also have under view camera settings, we can turn on this uh, resolution gate. And I wanted to keep my aspect ratio 1920 by 1080. So if we go into the camera settings, we can uh, tell it to be a width of 1920 by 1080 and click this maintain width and height ratio. So once I had one camera set up, you can middle mouse drag a camera in there to take a look at it. So I'd have one camera set up and then I would just duplicate it, hit control D and then uh, rotate the camera position on there like that. And uh, after I set up a new camera, just hit control D and make a new camera. So I made five different cameras that you see here. And there's a way to get this information into Substance Painter, and that's pretty simple. So we can just select the cameras, and then we can select our uh, game res folder. I do have the high res at that point. I was just using that to kind of take a look at everything. So we can do that and say File Export Selection. And if we go to the VX Export Type, and if we edit Presets, um, we've talked about turning these parts on, but there's also an area for cameras, and so you can enable and make sure cameras are put on there. So you can export that out. I gave it a new name, and I just uh, gave it the same name I had before, but underscore like with cameras. Um, I'm going to go into Substance Painter, and what we can do is we can update the project file. So everything's the same for like what we just looked at. But um, if I go to edit and do project configuration, this is where we can update our file and replace our new FBX with something that was there before. So if you want to update UVs, and right now we're importing with new camera data, I'll just go ahead and say select, and then we need to find the FBX file. And this is what I was telling you. This is the old name, and I just put underscore with cameras just to make it a little bit easier for myself to remember. And we can hit open like that and you want to tell it to import camera so you want to make sure that that's turned on and go ahead and hit OK and that will update the file and you want to make sure everything came over with your material names and everything else like that um, now that you've imported cameras you should see under here the ability to take a look with this uh, perspective camera data right here like this and so there is this thing with the camera settings and if you go to this viewport settings right here you can say show camera frame and you can turn that on and you can black out this area if you want. I'll just dim it just a little bit. And so you can see we've got access to all of our different cameras that we had before. So that's pretty cool. The next thing I'm going to show you is us going into a different rendering mode. So we're going to go to mode and go to iRay render. And this will take us into an offline renderer that you see here. Um, as this is rendering, I'm going to go to display settings, and what I like to set up for this is uh, some of these things within here. So we have um, the environment exposure, I'll leave that where it's at. The environment rotation is rotating the light around, just kind of like what we would do before. So you can hold down shift and right click, and that will rotate uh, the light around. Now I did have to set my ground and um, I have a ground, I put this clear color on, if I don't have the clear color on then it's going to do the um, HDRI file in the background and I didn't really like that. So you turn this on, you can choose a color for your background that you have within here. And then with this ground turned on, um, I needed to find kind of where the ground would sit on here. So if I put it at zero, it was like the ground plane was like somewhere in the middle of the object here. So I had to kind of just keep nudging this number down to find uh, where this would sit on here like this. And so there was just a little bit of work uh, for that, for that part. And then if we go into the render settings, you can see that uh, the default might be, I think this is a really low number for this max time. So if it starts to render and um, it still looks a little bit noisy and you want that to clean up, if it's still noisy, you can keep adding time. And I found 200 to 300 was giving me a, a nice number for um, you know how, how long it was taking to render and everything it was doing for, for rendering on that. Um, and then at that point, um, when it's done rendering, you can just say Save Render. And I just kept it the same name as what I had for the cameras here. So I just put a Canon underscore at the very beginning. And so I was just rendering out different TIFF files, so rendering those things out. Um, 
and if you want you can always go once you're done saving everything out you can go mode and go back to painting so that's a way that you can switch back and forth between the painting mode and these different modes for uh, taking a look at your cameras so I'll just go back to the default camera like this and I've just opened Photoshop and hopped on over to Photoshop and so then I can just go ahead and go to this area and then hold down shift and select all these images and just open them take a look at uh, what we've got for the different images in here so once it loads up I'm just going to hit uh, control R for this I'm just hiding the uh, rulers on there and I just want to zoom in on one of these images and take a look so I'm going to just tap F and then tap F again and I can go into uh, full frame mode. Control Alt 0 and try to frame the image and I can hit Control Plus and that'll zoom in and I'll zoom back out. Let me go to uh, Window and make sure I've got a navigator real quick. I just want to see if I'm at 100%. So yeah, so this, uh, this image is at 100%. Now saving out as the um, TIFF file format looks like it's in 32 bits so if you want to edit it you're probably going to drop it to 16 or 18 bit like this and I will just put this on custom exposure and gamma and I think that should give us uh, something very similar to what we had inside inside of there you know you can notice that there might be some banding on there um, if I was going to spend a little bit more time trying to figure that out in particular uh, what it's uh, what it's kicking out there um, so I'm going to tap F again real quick and then just take a look at the oops sorry the, the bottom here so let me tap that I'll hold down alt and then click on there and you can see the width and the height is a little bit larger than 1920 by 1080 so in there it kind of it just rendered the image um, a bit larger than the 1920 by 1080 now if you wanted you can tap M for your marquee and you could put style fixed ratio um, and I can do 19 it won't let you do 1920 by 1080 it'll let you do 192 and I can take off the zero in here and the height I can take off the zero on the end of there that will constrain this to a 1920 by 1080 image the other thing you could do is do a fixed size so I could I could do a 1920 by 1080 like that and that will just make a marquee and then I can just frame this up and then go image crop and then maybe save as control shift s and if I was saving on the computer the same area then I could just change this to like a JPEG if I was going to upload it to the internet or something like that and so um, if you wanted to get some compression on there drop the file size down a little bit lower you know you could do that but if you could just leave it at 12 too just like this so then at that point now I've just saved out my image and uh, I've got a JPEG image and it would be ready to go ahead and upload to the internet so in this section um, we've taken a look at how we can export all of our pieces out from Maya and ZBrush make sure that they're all coming in that we can bake our maps that are getting all the different map types that we want and then we can do a nice render of all of our work and then document it and put that on the internet.